Yes. I can hear you breathing in the microphone. Can you put your microphone sideways? Okay. Now it's better? Yes. We, yeah. Okay. Good. So we'll, I'm, I started the recording, so I think you can see that the, the recording is uh, being activated, right? Now we we'll share the application. Now you can see the slides, right? Yes, we do. Yes? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. So Pascal is not doing yet, but I think we can start. Um, welcome everyone. This is the second internet meeting for this year. Please uh, be aware that uh, this is aligned with the notebook meeting. Those are the meeting materials. Please uh, put your name into the etherpad. Is it the world class blue sheet? Okay, this is the agenda. So we're going to talk now about the ITF 108, what will we do? And then uh, Pascal is going to introduce us uh, a lot of new information. Then Raul talk about the new option of backward compatibility. Then we can discuss about the Mm, compression, if uh, how it's related to end extension, if we can move forward with the document or we need to indicate something there. Then Raul uh, is going to uh, expose these uh, written observation topics that are still open and his new work in group acknowledge. Some comments about the agenda? Okay, thank you. So for the ITF 108, we have that the meeting is going to be like five days, uh, every day with five hours between 11 to 4 UTC every day. And the slots are going to be for 15 or 100 minutes uh, with 20 minutes break. And they're going to plan eight tracks in parallel. So with that situation, what do you think the working group is the best for us. It's like we meet during ITF 108 or we meet uh, after, right after the end, like we did last time. And how much we will need? What do you think? How many slots? What do you think? Someone want to comment? Well, yeah, as a participant, I'd rather have the meeting during the ITF week because it's uh, more focused and it's easier for me to explain to my employer that I'm at the IETF for that week and not doing something else in the meantime. That's just my, my opinion. So, sorry, for you it's better to have the role meeting during the ITF 108? During that week, yes. Okay. My vote. Okay. So it would be uh, in approximately eight weeks, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been approximately, we had an interim about a month ago, I think, so yeah. even sooner than that. Um, so I, I, I do like having these interim meetings. I think they're more productive. Um, we are missing Pascal, but... Um, uh, I'm concerned that the eight tracks in parallel mean that we will have some conflict and we won't we won't have all the people we need anyway. So I'm not opposed to having a meeting, but um, I don't think we need more than one slot. And uh, I think we should still plan on having another interim, uh, having other interim meetings. Okay. 
Thank you, Michael. Mm. Well, I think that, uh, yes, that was going to be very crowded for everyone. I think so. For me, works like, a, I think it's going to be easier if we meet like after ITF with the interim meetings. Uh, we can have two hours and uh, it's going to, I think people are going to be more relaxed that, that uh, attending tracking in parallel in case that they have several works. But well, it's uh, up to the uh, community what they want to be doing. So it would be nice if uh, everyone can expose what they they think. We have. Mm -hmm. So additional comments. So maybe we can have this to the mailing list. I'm, I'm from my side, I'm okay with either options. I mean, okay. during the idea, if I don't mind. So, George, you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. So, probably we will ask to the mailing list to get the confirmation and see what else is better. Mm -hmm. For the, okay. Yes. If it's not uh, during the ITF week, I recommend we don't do it after, uh, that is August, because it's not a good time. Ah, okay. Okay. Okay, we, we will track all these comments and apply the first course of action. Thank you very much. So, well, if we made in the ITF, one zero eight with one slot will be kind of okay, and then we meet in interim in case needed. Okay, take note. So then Pascal is not yet here, right? Participants. Okay, Pascal is not here, so we can go to Raul. Sorry, what do you say? I'm an email, but I and I can't find them on on any chat that I have. Um, uh, he should be on the Cisco internal chat, but I don't can't I don't have him. I mean the Cisco Web Apps Teams that is. So. I don't have in chat. Yet. I haven't found him, so I don't know. Yeah, so um, we can jump to Paul. It's fine. Okay, so uh, Thank you. You know, if, if, if by the end of this meeting, if Pascal doesn't come back, I would like to come back to his slides, uh, uh, go yeah. his slides and the, right, okay. Okay, uh, so this is about uh, the backward compatibility issues that we have been having for all the new options uh, that we have been, uh, that, that most of the drafts are bringing forward. Uh, one of the major issues is that whenever we have a new extension, we, we, we have a RPL extension, it's in the form of a new RPL control option. And naturally, some of the 6LRs or 6, 6 LRs will, uh, who don't know that will, will, we will be dropping those. So we had the same issue with capabilities. So we, we thought that maybe in the future, if, 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 if some node doesn't understand the capability, then they will drop it. So we introduced some features such as uh, if a node doesn't understand the capability, then it has to uh, it has to still copy it forward depending upon an, uh, another bit. Uh, so, so, so the same mechanism has to be introduced for RPL control options is what we think. Uh, now we cannot be as flexible. So, so what I have here are two proposals. Uh, one proposal. Is, is is in which we don't increase any control overhead, but it may not be as flexible as we might want it to be. Uh, we might be able to just manage the copying mechanism. But in the last interim, uh, Pascal mentioned that apart from the copying mechanism, if we can have similar flip, uh, but that is slides, uh, but 
on this slide, basically, I have two examples. One is the enrollment priority, uh, which essentially defines a new control option, uh, the mean priority, which has to be. Uh, I'm sorry, can, can you please go back to the previous slide? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, enrollment priority has mean priority. Uh, uh, there is a control option and it has to be copied. And there is another draft which is eliding RPL option, which introduces uh, a new AOO option, uh, which essentially me which 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 says that ideally a six LR should not copy forward this this option if it doesn't understand. So currently RPL uh, RFC does uh, sixty five fifty doesn't say what has to be done if a control option is not understood. 6550 is very clear about how to handle if a code is not understood. That is, a message should be silently ignored if a code is not understood. But if a control option is not understood, there is no clarity in the document. So uh, basically, for eliding article option or uh, eliding article info, what we need is a mechanism in which 6LR should be dropping the option if it doesn't understand. It will be catastrophic if an option which is not understood by a 6LR, if an AO option which is not understood by 6LR is not stripped off but carried forward. So these are the two current problems that we have already. Uh, is, uh, next slide, please. So the expectations are uh, very straightforward. Uh, the first uh, paragraph says that at least we need to have a mechanism in which the option should be carried forward, copied as it is, if it is not understood, or the option should be dropped altogether. This has to be explicitly stated in, in, in the RFC, in, in, in the document. There are, however, more possibilities, just like capability flags. Uh, we can have a flag which says drop or discard the message if option is not understood, or join as 6LN if option is not understood. It's not very easy to handle the, the subsequent flags. I'll tell you why in the subsequent slides. Uh, next slide, please. So the first proposition is a very simple one. Uh, we have the second high order bit. Now, during our last interim, I mentioned that we can have a high order bit to indicate copy flag. But I missed out on one point that the high order bit has already been made use of in 6550 for the secure options. So we cannot use that. So we have all we have left is the second high order bit. But it means uh, 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 basically the C flag can be added there. This would mean that there won't be any change in the uh, in the existing implementations uh, without. So so there won't be any increase in the control over it at all. But at the same time, we cannot afford to have more bits such as join and discard uh, like capabilities because it would simply reduce the entropy of option type. Uh, it's it's uh, look when I say C, it doesn't necessarily decrease or reduce the entropy of the option type because uh, that that option is uh, that can that option is still valid. What I'm trying to say is if a C flag is set. It means that that value is actually getting used. So all the others can be zero and C flag, C, C flag is used. But if we have joined, discard, then eventually we are reducing the entropy of option type and uh, we may not be able to, you know, if we have joined and discard, something like 32 uh, options will be remaining and we are already using 20. So that is definitely out of question. So this is what uh, is one op proposition. Uh, the other proposition on the, is on the next slide. Next slide, please. So here, what I'm uh, suggesting is uh, we have a X flag, extended option flag, and then after the option length, we have the eight bit option field. Uh, this is definitely more flexible. It would still work. It would still be backward compatible with the nodes who don't understand X, uh, but it would essentially mean that all the extended options have a additional byte that has to be carried forward. Uh, so uh, it's 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 uh, but if we have this, then we can we can have newer flags for option types as well for for, for different options. Uh, so these are the two propositions uh, that are possible in my opinion. If someone has uh, any other idea of handling this, uh, I would like to understand. Uh, next slide, please. I don't know whether there's a next slide. Yeah. 
Yeah, so one of the thing is uh, we would like to clarify this in the MOPEX draft and not the capabilities draft because essentially MOPEX draft is the draft which uh, which basically takes us forward to RPL V2 and we would like this to be managed. It, it's not, uh, logically speaking, it's not something that capabilities have to handle. It's, it's, it should be part of MOPEX in my opinion. But again, uh, this is something that uh, you know, is open for discussion. So in RPL v2, would we just implicitly say the X flag was set and then we would get that? Uh, no. Yeah. So let's assume that the X flag, so there are two cases. Let's say, for example, there is an RPL v1 node and RPL v2 node in the same network. RPL v1 node is not going to understand the X flag, but it would still be able to skip or it will be, it will, it will be doing the same thing that it was Good. doing before. But let's assume that we haven't we moved to an RPL v2 with a new mob pack. Okay. Um, would we still need the X flag, or could we? No, no. We could just assume that all options from now on have that extra the extra flags. Uh, no, no, no. We 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 should not assume that. So what, what I'm proposing is that the X flag only can be added for those options which need those extended flags. So we can still have the same old style uh, option types in place with RPL v2 as well. But if a certain option requires an extended flag, that can be set, and RPL v2 nodes will understand that flag as well. So it won't increase the control over it for those uh, those uh, traditional style, uh, old style uh, options. But uh, here the like, uh, RPL versus V1 uh, nodes, they have to understand that uh, X bit in the type, right? Yeah, so they won't understand. So that is that is uh, naturally RPL V1 is not going to understand those that, that bit. So the only thing that 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 kind of node can do is skip that option because anyways it doesn't understand that option, right? That option is applicable only. Unless until we mark, okay, this option is optional or this option is mandatory. Depending on that, they have to decide, right? Uh, no, let's let's say there is a new option which requires the six flag. Okay. Now let's say that this option goes to a RPL V1 node. All that RPL V1 node can do is skip this option. It can either strip it off or copy it. Uh, uh, 6550 is not clear about it, so we can't do anything. So we are what we are say, what I'm saying is we have the we we have a handling which is synonymous to the current handling or is same as current handling for RPL V1. For RPL V2, we have extended flag, which increases one byte control overhead for options which require this extended flag. We cannot keep it simple like in V2, like the like in uh, uh, IPv6 extended headers, they say it is optional header or mandatory. If mandatory, you have to process is optional. You can either skip or you can just forward. So in V2 cannot we keep some that uh, if first two bit any first bit you are saying it is a secured bit secured or unsecured next bit it can just say if it is um, set then it is a uh, mandatory or it is not set it is an optional so using this first two bit only any old nodes or new nodes can decide whether they have to process the option or they have to skip the option. So, Rabbi, essentially what you're saying is the same thing, is, isn't it? I mean, RPL V1, we, we will still run into a situation where RPL V1 won't understand this. Right? And uh, uh, so... When, when, when somebody like the old legacy code manager who have already implemented, what they would have been doing now, they would be directly checking the type and deciding. They would not be right. doing a bitwise check, okay, this bit I need to check. For security, yes, we check, right? I mean, uh, apart from security, no one implements security. That is a different point. But yeah, for security, so one has to check the bit. So, what is your point? I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I, you know, I got you. you told, uh, I'm saying instead of making that extra one byte, you told right in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Can we go to if the previous just... slide? Yes. we have only option okay. type and option length right yes depending on x bit you will decide this option flux right because new options may have this option flux 
Okay, I, well, I am. I mean to say, if we use this X B to just to say, okay, it is a mandatory, it is a mandatory uh, uh, option or uh, an optional option. So in that case, say, like old node, they can for them it is maybe all the new options can be considered as optional. If they don't understand, they can simply skip. But isn't that what I'm saying? Isn't that exactly what I'm saying? So if if the X flag is set only, then the option flags are not picture. Okay, okay, okay. Right? Okay. Okay, got it. I'd love to have uh, this, uh, you know, uh, Rabi, if, if, if you still think, you know, maybe we can have this discussion on mailing list, but yeah, but this, yeah definitely let's uh, discuss that. Yeah, this proposal number two uh, seems good for me because it has a uh, more extensibility in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see a comment by Karsten in the chat as well. Maybe Karsten, you want to jump in at the mic? Yes, I just wanted to propose a <clears throat> couple of terms here because Talking about optional options and mandatory options is confusing pretty quickly. Um, so in, in CoAP, of course, we ran through exactly the same kind of situation um, and we came up with the terms critical and ele elective options. So an option is either critical uh, or elective. Of course, uh, Ripple would need to define what you actually do when you get a critical option that you don't understand. In in Coop, that's easy. You can just uh, abort the transaction. But in uh, the routing protocol, that's a bit more complicated. And then we had uh, another bit. We have another bit called safe to forward, which means if you don't understand it, um, you can still pass it on. And and here, of course, you wouldn't uh, use safe to forward. You would just uh, use forward, um, even if not not uh, understood. So I don't know if you have any other parameters of option handling uh, in Coop. There are a few more, like like no cache key and and so on. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, Gaston. Actually, that that those are the flags. So elective, critical, and safe to forward. These are the three flags that we are looking for. And the X flag that is shown here just says that you know option flags will hold these values. Uh, so so so. If we follow proposition two, we can have all the three flags. But if we follow proposition one, we may not be able to have all the three flags. Like you, you mentioned, critical, elective, elective, and uh, uh, safe to forward. Right. Critical this is exactly the. Is one sorry. critical elective is one flag. So it, when it's set, it's critical. Right. <clears throat> when, when it's uh, not set, it's elective. And safe to forward is another. Uh, flag uh, and Coop, we need a few more because things are cached or not cached, and and, and so on. Okay. So so uh, those are so uh, critical and elective is one flag for us too, but apart from uh, and copy is same as safe to forward is what I believe. Uh, the other thing the other thing that RPL has is a node should join as a six ln if a flag is not understood or, or if our option is not understood. So that is one more primitive, which is RPL specific, which may not be generalized, which cannot be generalized. That, so these are the three flags that we intend to have. So essentially- Join a six LN. Yeah, three flags. Essentially you define a, the set of option flags that, that are uh, set when the X bit is not present and when the X bit is present, then you can do it explicitly. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, so that's that's about it. Uh, so, like, like uh, so, so just to just to confirm the last statement. So, only when the X bit is set, we can have these three flags, uh, which can be used in the new in, in proposition two. 
in case of proposition one, we cannot have three flags at all. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it's 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 very it's not flexible at all uh, in, in proposition one. Okay, thank That's you. That's but in case of uh, in case of the X bit is there or not, right? Option in RPL mm -hmm. version two option flag will always be there, right? No, 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 it's not there. So if only if the X flag is set, option flags will be there. If X flag is not set, then it's it's just the same old style option type. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, And and so the proposal is if X is not set, the the behavior that we just described, critical elective, save to forward, join a sleeve node, those need to be implicit. That that should be known from yes. the option type. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I think that you're also hearing that option yeah, no. proposal one is not that popular. I don't know if that yes. was implicit in everyone's comments. Um, and then I think that you're also hearing that, yes, you should do this in the MOPEX uh, document and that we need more examples to discuss so we understand yes. the um, uh, what, what's what's happening. That's right. So, so, so in the so we already have existing examples. So I'm hoping that, you know, existing use cases, at least we can satisfy. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, this discussion is almost similar to the capability bits discussion. So uh, we, we, we have pretty much, you know, thought about that uh, for a long time. So I'm hoping that uh, the same experience will hold true here. Yeah, maybe you can do some combination about these kind of three flags with these uh, optional or mandatory capabilities, like combinations. Uh, sorry. So, uh, uh, Maybe you could uh, specify examples like combining this kind yeah, of three yes. flags uh, with the capabilities when they are mandatory or uh, um, elective, optional. No, no, sorry, this actually, in this, this has got nothing to do with capabilities. There is absolutely no coupling between capabilities and this. Uh, I, I'm just thinking capabilities because we have the same same flags. flags in semantic, which can be applied here. But uh, I mean, there is no relation between these flags and the capability at all. Thank you. Okay. Let's, uh, let's get to the next one. Is that for me, the next one? So next topic that uh, we came in the last interim was about the compression of ripple control messages. Uh, there was a previous work in 2011 um, that uh, was proposed the DIO compression and the configuration option compression there. But uh, the document did not went forward then as well we have the generic header compression so so we start uh, discussing how will be the compression of the ripple control messages so we can start like a brainstorming but as well um, to move forward with the nc extension draft we want to con in this meeting that uh, we don't need uh, additional features in that document to, uh, that uh, is related with the compression mechanism for the IP addresses of the NC extension draft. So if, uh, I think last uh, last meeting uh, we agree, but um, the, we, we want that uh, for confirmation. If you think that uh, we can pr proceed with the NC extension or that needs some uh, compression mechanism. I think, George, I think what we said yeah. last time was that we do need compression mechanism to be generic enough, to be generic for any other mm -hmm. 
control message. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we, 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 from our side, we are open to contribute for a new work that will mm -hmm. be generic for a generic set of compression for the control messages. So mm -hmm. We are willing to contribute. Okay. If Thank you. Beginning, see. Thank you very much. Um, so, so one thing that we should do before, so so we, we uh, uh, and this is something that I'm not clear about is uh, how much. So so we have. Uh, aggregated targets we have parent set from ns extension we have parent address and we have our address vectors in case of rpl aod we have p2p rpl uh, so we have a lot of addresses that are going through these control messages i'm just wondering that how much of compression can ghc actually bring so if ghc uh, if if we are how much would we be optimizing if we will be if we will be putting in our new primitives, you know, if 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 if, if that optimization is maybe five to ten percent, I don't know, uh, but but if that optimization is maybe 25, 30 percent, maybe it will be. So what are data first? And I have not seen the full GLC, uh, uh, RFC, but I don't know how the numbers will look like. So it would be great if someone before you know, uh, Georges, if you know, we can have some sort of numbers uh, for GHC. Does that make sense? I, mean, uh, yes. but I don't understand why do you need such number, right? I mean, there are many different drafts that they are extending somehow the, uh, the, the control packets, right? And that you may potentially include or not the IPv6 addresses. Whether now so so what I'm saying is... The best one or not Sorry. the good one, and, and another story, right? So we can either use GHC or... I don't, I don't know actually this draft, right? So GHC got me very trivially got me fifty percent compression with a very naive compressor. That was like eight years ago that I did the test and it was like 30, 40 lines of C code. Like it was the stupidest compressor possible. And I got a I got a very, very good numbers on on control messages because there's lots of zeros and stuff in there. Um so um you can try again with newer stuff but it's uh bet the best is if like if we get a, a library of of um, sample packets that are representative right so so in my opinion actually 50 percent compression may not be good enough because because uh, if you see the 16 bytes uh, if if, if if an address is compressed to just eight bytes, uh, in, in I mean, in, in some in lot more, lot of cases, it may not be possible to compress to below eight bytes. But uh, yeah, again, maybe maybe we should uh, maybe the, the the scenario that you used was uh, uh, may possibly give you only fifty percent compression at best case. Uh, so uh, I I have sample sample packet sets if anyone's interested uh, you know, with with all this. Uh, uh, control messages so for PS set and yeah I, I can I can George. Do, uh, George I think you had um, implemented a uh, six low orange type of compression yes. for those packets yes so what kind of compression ratio did you achieve with that can you answer uh, Raul's uh, interrogation uh, six six to one helped a lot. It's essentially reduced. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember that we could indeed include uh, multi, a lot many many IPv6 addresses. We dropped out six lora because again we came back without compression. But six lora helped a lot. I can check the numbers and I can send you if you want. Um, what, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, the thing here is that, to me, I don't understand why we need to link the generic compression, any generic compression that we are going to work on with NSA extension. I mean, we may have a standalone compression mechanism that can be applied to any other protocol, including NSA extension. This is what this is my main concern. Right. Exactly. I, I agree with you. But um, the reason why I think several people are uh, 
worried or interested in looking at figures is that in this case you have a list of addresses um, and and so compression is really badly needed and the the reason why I, I said I would want to have a, a, a vision for how compression is going to be achieved is that some other mechanisms like the first draft that, uh, by Mukul Goyal, who is listed, which is listed here, is an ad hoc compression. It, it takes it each field and figures how it can be represented on fewer bits. And so if we need such kind of things, then we need to have the, the hooks, the the flags, the, the reserved bit somewhere in in NSA uh, to do this ad hoc compression. But I'd, ra I'd much rather go for a generic mechanism. So that's just what I wanted to sense if everybody agrees with that and is ready to, to go in that direction and work on a generic mechanism, either for compressing addresses or for compressing any kind of header, then I'm fine. So that was my intention that there was a conclusion from the previous uh, interim. Also, we need to negotiate compression, whether it's going to be used. Um, and so it fits into the whole uh, capabilities draw document um, as something we might want to negotiate. And it seems that we're creating a lot of interesting um, uh, uh, extensions and so it might be good if people could optimize less because they could assume compression I'm just say in the silence that I've texted and messaged Pascal through three or four different ways and uh, I'm a bit worried now yes yeah, so did I actually and then it's miss as well just for the record we, we, we have currently three types of compression right so so COMPR which is uh, I mean six P2P RPL and RPL AODV is making one Type of compression using one type of compression. Six law RH is another, and GHC is another. So six law RH, if, if we, we discussed before, that maybe six law RH might become a norm with RPL V2, and if it does, I mean, then then the, then we might uh, we might have something like that be used in all the context. Okay, so it seems I'm hearing everybody agrees that we will have some generic compression mechanism, something that works across uh, ripple options. And so we don't have to do anything special for anything. And as Georgia said, maybe we already came to that conclusion last time. Good yeah, but but, no, but this 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 but this would mean uh, would this mean uh, updating the NSA document because uh, because the NSA extension currently does not do any compression or uh, if six law RH has to be done then maybe it has to be provisioned now because six law RH is already there and we we, we are also closing on by for R two V two so so uh, what I'm trying to say is you know. You may uh, have that to was my original question. Okay. Uh, that was the original question. Do we need to provision something to say this is the uncompressed version, this is a compressed version, uh, okay. or, or will compression work above these options irrespective of their encoding? I mean, their flags or whatever. I believe so. we should do this, yeah. I didn't understand what Raul you meant, but what I've seen is that you are having the flux before and then you don't care what's inside, right? So it can be with or without the compression, it should be work in both cases. Uh, yeah, so 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 right now uh, NSA extension doesn't have any flag at all to say that there is a compression that is compression or uh, that it is compressed or not compressed. No. 
But if NSA doesn't have, because the IO has also the IO will have this flag, then it will be automatically inject in, into our in, into the NSA, right? So if the if, if yes, this was sent, yeah. To put the so, I mean, so do you want to put inside the metal container or outside? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I think it should be outside. And if it is outside, then it has nothing to do with the MC, which is which is the NSA. Same with the siblings, okay, right? I if a node will give the siblings. The one that the one of the work of Pascal situation, right? Actually, actually, I'm I'm not sure if I'm hearing you properly. I'm sorry, uh, but uh, I can hear a lot of breathing uh, sound and yeah, then Ines, in between. Ines, I think you're breathing into, in, into the mic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So so sorry, uh, George. Can you please repeat what you, what you said last? I mean, what I was trying to say is depending on where we want to place the flag, right? If it's going to be in or out of MC. If it, yes, if mm. it's outside. If it's outside, then we do not need to touch NSA. Okay, okay. And like this, if it if it being outside, then it can be apl applicable to any other work that requires such compression. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, that's true. Okay. So uh, I think I think uh, maybe, I'm hearing. So, 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 but, 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 yeah. Version. Not you said, guys. Yeah, sorry, we stepped over one each other. I, I think we are saying we, we want compression for a lot of options and for, for options we already have, for options we, we're going to create in the future. And so we gamble that we're going to be able to do good compression over all options. And so we don't need a hook in this one. Yes. This, this is my this is my understanding. Any anybody opposed to that conclusion? Write it in the etherpad. Yeah. <laughs> we do. Okay, thank you. We move forward. I work, please. Okay. Uh, so I, 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 this, these slides are not going to be detailed slides. Most of the problem statements about RPL observations are present more than a couple of times in previous ideas in in, in, in physical sessions. So. Uh, the aim for this uh, discussion is that I have a list of all the points uh, in our bill observation draft uh, and I've mentioned the current status and the possible next steps in some of the cases. I don't know what the next step should be. Uh, some of the work has already been initiated for some of the problem statements. Uh, for this, for some of the problem statement, there has absolutely been no progress at all. Uh, and uh, you know, so let's go about point by point. So first is the handling DTS and increment problem in storing mode of operation. Uh, right now, the way I see it is that it's very difficult to get interoperability in place for uh, between between uh, uh, between implementations, for example, right at Contiki, just because the way they, in which the DTSNs are incremented between these implementations. Uh, Specifically for storing mode of operation, there is no there is no clarity available from 6550. Uh, for non-storing mode of operation, there is absolutely no problem uh, because uh, root is controlling everything. A uh, lot of problems, 
how this deviation increment is handled results in a lot of control overhead a lot of uh, you know the, especially the sub do dag route update completely depends upon this uh, previously we had a discussion within pascal mentioned that sub do dag route update problem is a different problem you know uh, a 6 lr when it switches the parent updates uh, sub do dag routed at that node to its uh, preferred parent the new preferred parent so there are a lot of options there. Uh, not sure if we should handle it in a PCP or uh, so, so all these points are actually mentioned in the in, in the draft as to what are all the problems and what are all the deliberations that have to be clarified uh, if someone is uh, putting up this best card practice. But the way I see it, there is no change. At least as of now, I don't see any change that is required in the standards uh, for that. Uh, uh, but if someone can optimize actually, uh, then uh, then someone can think of some change so as of now i think it may be a bcp you know, document the second one is about dawak handling so uh, the problem was uh, uh, the end-to-end -end traffic has to be initiated by the node only once the end-to-end -end path has been established so 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 uh, that is one problem also if if, if a node switches the parent in some cases, the the six LR might want to know if that parent, if it was able to establish a complete end-to-end -end path through this new parent. So the, the uh, again, this work is already in progress. So there is a draft for this, so I won't go into the details. So interpreting trickle reset is the next point. Uh, this came up because there is uh, a re, re, uh, resetting trickle back to the uh, back to the min or resetting the trickle timer within the current uh, timer so there were there were two interpretations uh, maybe this should be clarified uh, rpl observations already clarifies it but uh, since rpl observation is not going to be a published document so uh, I, I don't know whether it warrants a new draft or whether it, it can be used all these things can be combined together in a single bcp uh, Point number six, the section six talks about handling resource unavailability. What it means is, in case of storing MOP, uh, a, a high level uh, hierarchical, so a node two level up may not be able to signal uh, its resource unavailability to the node below. But now, in, in some way, main priority handles it. Uh, the main priority field, field should be handling it. So I think, I, I think we are good for that. But uh, I try to check if there are any deliberations which uh, which may not be handled by mean priority. I couldn't find any. So I think that should uh, take care of it. Uh, point section seven talks about handling aggregated targets. Uh, now, if a sub, sub do that uh, during parent switch, if a 6LR updates the complete sub do that at its point to another preferred parent, then there will be a lot of sent as part of uh, the DAO. It definitely makes sense to aggregate those targets and compress it if possible. Uh, Again, there has been some discussion about compressing these address vectors, and I'm I'm hoping that uh, whatever uh, whatever new whatever existing mechanism or new mechanism that we talk of will take care of this form statement as well. Then there is transmit transit information option. There are certain fields such as path sequence, which are mandatory for operation, but uh, RFC doesn't mandate it. Uh, so how whether they should they should be mandated or you know how they should be handled is is another point. Uh, ninth uh, section number nine is uh, uh, is upgrades to RPL. Now when I wrote this section, I didn't think only from the control options point of view, which we are we are sort of handling now, uh, but in general about all the other other places also where usually the backward compatibility or upgrades uh, uh, upgrades have a problem. Uh, but in my opinion, maybe backward compatibility option handles it in the most, in most of the questions that I have raised in that context in RPL observations are answered by backward compatibility. So uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has uh, some other point with regards to upgrades in general for RPL. Uh, next, next slide, please. Next slide, please, uh, Ines. Uh, 
The slide is current status continuation. That start with 10. Path control bits handle. I, I, I don't see the new slide. I'm not sure if others can see it. Uh, I, I, I'm still stuck on the same, same, same slide as before. Okay. I, I changed it. Current status. You changed it, huh? Yeah. Okay. Will you see the rest? Uh, uh, I can't see the. Okay, now I can see it. All right. Okay. Yeah. So section ten. Uh, it's about. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ines. The path control bits. So uh, this is an interesting observation uh, because uh, sixty-five fifty says that the path control bits are a mandatory fields, and interestingly or surprisingly, none of the existing implementations actually follow that uh, must clause. So what should we do? Actually. The path control bits should come into picture only with multiple preferred parents. But RFC 6550 says that even without multiple preferred parents, path control bits have to be set, indicating at least one path is reachable. But none of the implementations currently do that, and none of the open implementations currently do that. So, uh, wondering how should this be handled? Uh, next is. Uh, uh, section 11, adjacency probing with RPL. I think uh, uh, George's uh, draft uh, sort of covers it. Uh, it. It Not sort of, it, it actually covers it properly. Uh, and I guess it's up for adoption. Uh, then we have eliding. So how do we handle? So there is a lot of static information which flows in DIO all the time. Uh, eliding RPL info essentially takes care of it. It's, 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 it's in progress already. Uh, next, point number 13 is very interesting because I remember we had discussed this and we had said that uh, lollipop counters, the linear part has to be backed up into the persistent memory to avoid problems. Uh, so we still are saying that we still need persistent storage in the linear part of all the lollipop counters. This is a problem for a lot of uh, deployments. This is certainly a problem for the, uh, I mean, the, the deployment that I'm working on. So, so I'm wondering if we, sh we, we, we should handle this problem wherein either we make the linear part small or just making it small won't help. Uh, we, we may need some other work. So, so one, one of the interesting point is uh, Pascal has handled this problem in a very interesting way for the new option that he has suggested for the AOO option in the eliding article info draft. So what he has done is he has used, uh, so the RCSS, uh, so the new options, so what eliding RPL info does is it it, it uh, avoids sending the static configuration all the time. It does this by sending a counter uh, in place of all that information. And if you see the same counter, you know that the same information is well. What uh, uh, Pascal has mentioned in the draft is if, until and until and until and unless the lollipop counter goes into the circular part, the whole information has to be kept kept on broadcasting. This eliminates the need for persistent storage altogether for that lollipop counter. Something similar if can, if it can be done for TTSN, Dodak version, uh, and a lot of other uh, DAO uh, sequence I guess don't have problem, but uh, all other uh, lollipop counters. Uh, section 14 talks about capabilities. Mm, the capability draft is already in progress. And section 15, there are a few points about RPL under specification where 6550 is not clear. And I feel those are uh, those are not a big deal, uh, but, but they might just need some clarification. Uh, actually, those points were clarified to me. They, they were not clear to me when I implemented stuff, and then they were clarified to me by the working group, and then I moved it to the under specification. That's all. Actually, these uh, these are the fifth and um, twelve points. Oh. So it looks like we have Pascal online as well. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I yet entered the the meeting for three hours from two hours from now. So I don't I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, so, so it was CM which I understood as being Pacific Coast or something. I don't know. Other way around, actually. Okay, so. No worries. We shifted your presentation to later in the, in the meeting. Too. 
We still have a slot. Thank you, Dominique. Welcome. So, so basically, through this slides, what I'm trying to say is, in some cases, I don't know what to do, or uh, maybe uh, working group should uh, decide what to do for those points, or um, you know, uh, or have just a PCP and put all the points there, or I'm not sure what to do. A uh, lot of, a lot of, a lot of points are already handled in one way or the other. Uh, yeah, uh, the eliminating need for persistent storage. Also, we we had discussed a lot of times before, and I feel this. Uh, this problem, uh, th this has to be handled one, uh, you know, we, we can't, it's not ac acceptable that a deployment has to depend on a persistent storage just because it uses RPL, you know, because if the application doesn't depend upon any persistent storage, but RPL and then it depends upon it, so. Raul, uh, I was already there when you started discuss discussing uh, the persistent storage problem, and um, I think we, we kind of discussed it, but maybe it was one to one in the past. Um, yeah. So there are two things that, that you can do. One is uh, not to use a straight part of 16, right? I mean, it's the max, but, but you could actually start at 254 or something. And I guess that's what you had in mind when you mentioned my um, other draft on synchronizing uh, the, the, the options. And so, so you, if you start at 250 something, then the straight part is very narrow. You, you have control on that in any given spec. And even in the implementation, I guess, we could say, hey, um, you, you can configure it, for instance, while you start. And then um, if, if you have something which kind of advances quite quickly, uh, even if you start at um, 248 or I don't know, um, if, if, if you increment quickly, say somebody has a level which is 252 and you start at 248, after four iteration, you'll pass him. So if somebody st is stuck somewhere in the straight line, there is a point where you will pass him. Um, for DIOs, I mean, when we discussed it, you, know, you mentioned that sometimes the DIO don't progress very quickly. And if they don't, then we can stay stuck for a very long time. So exactly. it, it, it has to do with um, how you, you, you advance the straight line. So the, imp the implementation could make sure it, Stays only um, for a certain duration inside the straight line, for instance. We don't have a spec for that. Um, when we do the repo v2, when we do 6550 bits, just like your errata question, when you do 6550 bits, we could say, hey, uh, there should be a parameter somewhere, which is how long you can stay in the straight line. And, and so after that, you have to, to go in the, the road space, and so you will pass away very stuck in the straight line. So this, this is something that, that we could do. There is another thing that we could do yet, which is each time the root reboots, it generates a four bytes um, random, something like that, and you place it in the DIOs um, just to say, oh, it's my random boot block you know, with, with like two bytes or four bytes random, you have a good chance that, that you know it's a new, something new. So if somebody has history about what you did in the past um, and, and he sees a random that was never there, then it's, an, it's newer. Um, that's the sort of thing we could do. Now, how we, we specify this beyond what people can implement, I mean, I believe that at some point there will be a 6550 bits. When we are ready with Repo V2, look at what IPv6 has done. They, they, they basically matured a good number of specifications around 2460, and then they did, they did 8200, and they did 201, they did 202, I mean, they, they did the family. So, so they have a consistent thing. So, so now you're working on capabilities and MOPEX, and, and we, we have DAO projection, we have a use of Repo Info, et cetera. So we are building all those specifications. And so that will be a 6550 bits to, to, to gather everything, which will be starting at a map above um, eight or something. And so that's the, that's the time where your draft will really, really come handy because it's, it's the early list of what we need to fix. That's, that's how I see it. So, so, so uh, uh, Pascal, so this is what I gather uh, from, uh, so there, there are two approaches that you have mentioned. One is, uh, reducing the window size, sequence window size, uh, 
that is one possible option. The other possible the option that you mentioned was sending to yeah the the straight part uh, the, the 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 window sequence, the sequence window uh, should be reduced. That's the state part. So the other option that you mentioned was sending a random uh, information uh, from a uh, random four bytes from the root. For the first thing, there was an <laughs> option to 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 have a, a time uh, bound as well, right? Say you can't stay more than two hours in a straight line. So after two hours, you move. You have to increment and move out of the straight line. So, so uh, uh, Pascal, the observation drafts, you know, one more thing, you know, what we have observed is that it may not be necessary for all the sequence counters to be handled in a generic way. For example, DTSN might need a specialized hand. And uh, path sequence and DTSN are the most critical. When DAO sequence uh, may not have problem, you know, so what I'm trying to say is, Maybe a common sequence, lowering the sequence window for across all the sequence counters, uh, uh, may, it, it may not be needed, you know, is, is what I believe. I One more thing that I want that. to mention. I did not mean to do that. Basically, section seven of Ripple gives you a generic mechanism. Uh, okay. And then, as you say, for each counter, and I have one, as you mentioned, for the synchronization of options. Uh, we may say, oh, within that generic framework, which, which has a straight line up to 16, uh, we'll just use two or three, or we'll put a time bomb, or whatever. Or we'll, uh, you know, that's so, so I'm not saying do that for everyone. I'm saying you have the option. But, but yes, I agree, it could be for each individual. Okay. So one one more thing that I wanted to just uh, confirm with you uh, and Pascal, this is about the draft and the handling that you have suggested for AOO option in the lighting RPL info. Uh, so it also has a new lollipop counter that is added, but you clearly state in that case that unless and until the lollipop counter goes into the circular state, you should keep on broadcasting all the information. This is an explicit statement that is made in the eliding article yes. info. This is yes. great because it solves the problem in a nice uh, context specific way. You know, I'm just wondering if something such, such, something like this can be uh, can 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 be thought about at least. You know, if, if it may not be possible to handle it in uh, something like this this way for all the other it's called lollipop counter, but if it gets handled in this way. Something like this way, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, that would be great. Uh, that makes sense. But, you know, for existing repo, uh, even if you write an errata or something, it's not even an errata. An errata is really a correction for what exists. It's not for adding something new. Uh, but the implementations are already there. So that's why I'm, I, I'm more interested in focusing on Ripple v2, where we can really say, you know, the, the starting point, you can expect to have this, 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 this. So let's make sure we have a clear list of what we want to make sure we have in Ripple v2. And that's why your document is so critically important. We can be, so basically what we're saying is we'll, we'll, we'll put something specific to our v2 and then uh, we can think about uh, how to handle the sequence window and uh, uh, if we can make use of some context specific information in context to individual lollipop counters we'll see it there right works for me uh, I, i'm sorry for being late guys but did you already discuss the capabilities draft uh, I think I don't think we are discussing capabilities draft in this interim. Uh, okay, because I, okay, so, so I reviewed it, but maybe we can work as uh, co-authors. So I think with you, Ramal. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's it from this uh, set of slides, I guess. Uh, next slide, please. Let me just check if there's another one. There was another one. There was not. The uh, rock acknowledge. It's the last one. Okay. Yeah. So uh, now if you can see the Pascal slides. Welcome, Pascal. Thank you, Ines. Uh, did you give me the ball? I, I'm uh, LP1 working group. Don't ask me, but that's because I use it just as you do. And I guess you will appear as whole working group when you log in somewhere, Ines. Just the memory uh, inside. Uh, so please give me the ball. No? 
Okay, so, so sorry, I, sorry. I didn't understand what you say. I was asking you give me the control, but if you want to, to oh, move okay. the slides. I met okay. one working group. Okay, I stop sharing now. You should have the control. Uh, right now, yeah. you, uh, you're still shown as, as having the ball. Okay. So if you right click on LP1 working group and say make presenter. Okay, general to presenter. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I get it. Now, now you are. I am. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so, but I don't see the slides. So, so did you upload them or did you share them? How did you? Okay, I will share them. Okay, wait. Um, okay, I will, uh, Ines, offline, let's chat. I need to show you a few things about WebEx. Okay, now you should be able to see. Yes, I your see my slides. Slide. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I expected that you had uploaded them, but you did not. Yes, they are they are they are uploaded. Okay. Okay, we we uploaded on what? On WebEx. We we we'll talk after the meeting. Okay. So, so let's upload it on on the data tracker. I think that's what yeah, but that's not what I'm talking about. When you, when you want to 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 give the ball. You want to upload the slides to WebEx first, and then they stay on the screen. You don't need to share your screen anymore. They are just up there. But but I, I need to show you that. So we'll do that offline. So please, next slide. So this is a draft that I wrote like sometimes like six months ago. That's because we had an interim and we agreed that for Ripple V2, we wanted to, to have a, um, a certain amount of functions and new functionality and what the those functions was the capability to make sure that all the configuration was up to date. And as you know, with Ripple as it stands, the root decides when it sends the configuration option. And after that, it may not send it for a long time. And a device that just boots or reboots may not get the configuration. And, and there is no way to know if you have the latest version of the configuration. And as it goes, we are now adding MAPEX capability, I mean, a number of uh, New, option, new options and new messages. And, and we are not clear as a new node joining that you have the latest of everything. So we, we said, hey, we need to have something to synchronize the database, quote unquote. And that's, that's when I started this draft. So the draft has not evolved because we had other priorities and we we're working on um, user of repo, rule, capabilities, all those drafts. But um, at some point, we still need to move on with this one. Right now, it's a personal submission. It's just you know, what came out of my mind, and I did not get a good chance to talk to anybody. So it's, we can really change it. I mean, it's just a first draft. But since I got no feedback, it's, it's still there. And it was like that at ATF 106. So it's been six months, something like that. Um, so next slide, please. So the goal, the goal is to make sure that in runtime, when nothing changes, you can have small DIOs and small DAOs, both. So the small DIO would elide uh, all the new options that we are talking about, configuration, capabilities, etc., and the new DAO could um, elide a, a number of route entries and just say same as before. Um, so it. In the DAO case, it would take us nearer what you get with a link state protocol, such as OSPF or ISIS, when you, when you sync the database. And as long as you know the, the last number that you saw has not changed, then you know that your database is up to, to, to date. With DAOs, the way Ripple was designed, we repeat over and over and over because we, we don't know if the guy we send to is there and we may lose messages. So we believe that by over and over, it's, it will end up working. Um, but there is a cost associated to that, the fact that you repeat your DAO periodically. And so having a way to say, oh, same DAO as before. Um, and if you add it, then you still have it. Um, that, that's kind of cool as well. So this draft does both, compressed DAO options and compressed DAO option. Next slide. So we, we basically, 
we could have said, hey, we have a sequence counter per option that we protect. But that would be a lot of sequence counters. So the proposal in this draft, and really we, I mean, that's, that's meant to be discussed, is um, basically we have a sequence counter for a stable state from the perspective of the root. And that stable state includes all the possible options that we want to protect. I mean, the current ones, and if we have more options in the future, and they will also be protected by that single sequence number. So what you really want to know is for each option that you care about, what is the last configuration state sequence, this LCSS, uh, sequence number at which it was changed? So by just exchanging, you know, with your parent, here is the, the RCSS to which I was sync. Then you can detect with your parent uh, what you missed and just synchronize that. That's the goal. Now, you will find in the gory details that because we are using section 7 of repo, I mean, the same uh, lollipop thing um, that Raoul was talking about earlier, we have this comparison window of 16 whereby even if we have a sequence counter of 256, two numbers are only comparable if they are, if they are 16 apart. So even if there is no change, every something like 16, you will need to resync. Just now, 16 could be hours or it could be weeks, just depend on how fast you change anything. But every 16 global change, even if they are in option B, you will have to resync every option because you, otherwise you cannot compare the sequence number you have in memory and the sequence number that the DIO is telling you. They can only be compared if they are within a 16 window. That's part of the way repo handles the, the sequence number to make sure that we don't have this A less than B less than C less than A that we had in OSPF v one <clears throat> So, so that, that's pretty much it. We have to update the base objects. We change the DIO because we need to to say, hey, it's DIO with RCSS blah. Then again, you only increment the RCSS when there is a configuration change, change in one of the protected options. So it's not that every DIO will have plus one. It's only when you change an option somewhere, like the configuration. So you can live a long, long time with the same RCSS. So same thing, we, we have a, a, an RCS, we have to modify the, the, the DAO, it's not the RCSS, but you have to modify the DAO to also indicate it's the same as DAO number blah. And then we, we had to change the this, and that's when you know the, this, uh, Dominic came into the discussion because he had other changes. Um, because we used the this to query the parent uh, in order to resync the options. So the idea is always the options come from, come from the root and they go down. So your parent is always more knowledgeable than you are. Actually, if you have multiple parents, you will see that in the draft we discuss finding the most up-to-date parent and synchronize. If you have only one parent, that you must be uh, more up-to-date than you are. So you basically sync with your parent. You use the this to say, hey, here is my RCSS and here is what I want to see. And the parent comes in and say, oh, this one has not changed, this one has changed. And the last thing that we added is this new AOO, AO option. And the AO option is basically an option that contains an option. So, so when you see the format, it will re it, no, an AO tells you I'm the AO for option blah, like configuration option. So you have the, this command value, this type, which says I'm an AO. Then you have the subtype, quote unquote, which says I'm the AAO for the configuration option. And then you find the RCSS. So in the subsequent DIOs, instead of placing for option, you might just place the AAO, AOO, which will say for this option, the RCSS of the last change was that. For this other option, the RCSS of last change was that. So that's what, what the AOO allows you to do. Just give for any given protected option what the RCSS was. So if you, if you have a child and it knows 
um, the, the, the configuration option for RCSS 15, then even if the RCSS has moved to 17, there will be an AOO, which will say for the configuration option, 16 is still good. 16 is the last, uh, I'm sorry, 15 is the last change. So the guy who has 15, he knows that he doesn't need to synchronize um, the configuration option. But since the RCSS has moved, there must be another option that he cares about. So that's how you can place all those options in this compressed form in a, in a single DM. If nothing changes, then just put the abbreviated option to say the RCSS of last change was this. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the idea is so far we protect all those options. So we have the uh, map packs, we've got the, the capability uh, um, that, that is, well, oh, the slide is obsolete. Now we have map packs and we have a capabilities draft. I've updated some things, but I failed to update that. So, so four and five are the new drafts that, that Raul has done. Uh, then we protect the route information option. It's not really used, but it's actually how uh, a given route can say, can reach that particular prefix, whereas another route may not be as good to reach that particular prefix. So it's, it's, it's like the routing option in the array. So the, the DODAC configuration option is the one we wanted to protect most. And then the prefix information option, if you don't change the prefix, why send over and over the prefix for the DODAC? So it's protected as well. Next slide. And like I said, if in the future we have more options, the same mechanism can apply. We won't need to define a new RCSS. So I introduced the AOO earlier. So here is what it is. There's an option type of option length that says, hey guys, I'm an AOO. Then you've got the abbreviated option. So the option that you are abbreviating, which is one of the five that we just saw. And then you have the RCSS where that protected option was changed for the last time. That's how the child can see, oh, it was not changed between there and now, and, and the last I knew, so I have the latest. Next slide. So the this was changed to place two things. And I'm not 100% clear that we both. Um, one thing was a set of flags to indicate which option the child wants to get. And the other is the RCSS that the child was synchronized to. So if the RCSS is now 17 and the child was, uh, last thing it saw was 14, then the child will say 14. Now, if the child says 14, then the parent should be able to say, oh, here is what he needs. In which case the parent doesn't really need the five bits, but they place them as well. Now, if we decide that we don't need that, then the five bits on the left, maybe we could avoid them. Those five bits is one per option. Basically, the child could say, hey, I want to get option blah. It just sets the flag. Now, it's, it's, it's two, two, two ways of asking something from the child perspective. I thought it was better to be able to ask with a fine grain, whatever you wanted, but maybe somebody will tell me it's useless. Anyway, you need one of the two. You need to be able to say, hey, here is my latest state. Um, please give me the latest for everybody. Next slide. And now I will ask you guys to read um, this is basically uh, a summary of the rules on how the RCSS works. And if you don't, I, I really wanted to discuss that on this call because I wanted you to have a chance to look at that text. So it's, it's the important piece inside the draft. Looks like a note one. Sorry? It looks like a note one. <laughs> Please read. <laughs> But this time I will give you time. That's why you missed the note one. <laughs> so Raul is telling us that some jet lag. And if you upload the slides, as I indicated, uh, 
you don't have this lag, it's one of the benefits. So Ines will stay, if you don't mind, will stay at the end of the call and I will show you. So Pascal, I have a question I'm wondering right now. So so uh, the uh, the draft changes the base objects, right? So uh, is that what you are trying to say that you know uh, uh, this this thing should be made use of only from RPL v two and you know yes. base? Uh, uh, th th that's the point uh, you want to convey. There. Mm -hmm. I would I, I would like to make sure that if you have a repo v two implementation, it has this thing. But you cannot ask a Ripple V1 to understand. So it's supposed to be backward compatible in that the V1 will ignore it. But really, you will not get the service that you want. So it's kind of useless. So this thing really starts with Ripple V2. Uh, yeah, so, so but, but it's, uh, so if, if, if there are any V1 nodes, uh, Basically, they won't they won't be able to join the net, net network at all because because uh, it uh, I mean once the RCSS starts getting sent and the RPL v1 node tries to attach it won't know how to query and all those things so we'll only the RPL map can be there. above seven right I mean the goal is when you start playing with this you will be you will be having a map above seven so so the, the node will join SLE for something. There is a lot of noise, so I could not hear your voices. There was some additional noise, however. But yeah, I guess we, we agree. I mean, the, the, the idea of the capability of this, etc., is to, to agree on the baseline that we want to have day one for Ripple V2, make sure that every Ripple V2 node will understand those things. So that will make a, a huge increment that will justify having a V2. So uh, did everybody read those five lines? Yeah, Pascal, I have one question. Uh, like. Uh, in in uh, do do you have separate RCSS, RCSS counter for each of the protected options no. apart from the group? No. Uh, that's a design point that we want to discuss maybe, but I mean having uh, to send too many RCSS and keep in memory too many RCSS looked like an overkill because most of the time nothing changes. So having a single RCSS that covers every option and changes every time any option is updated uh, looked like better so you, when you increment rcss you may change all options if you want to or you may change only one option but each time you change any of the option the rcss must be incremented so so uh, let's say if any option change, we have to always change the global RCSS option of DIO. And in abbreviation option, right, whatever new new option you have introduced, there for the, each of the options, we have to send the RCSS counter also, right? And all will have the same value, right? Exactly. That, that's why you have the AOO, because for each option, you will have the latest RCSS at which this option was changed. It's a, it's a way of doing it. But it will be same for all. So all the protected only options. Only one sequence counter, only one RCSS. It's the RCSS of the DIO, not an RCSS of the option. But you don't increment the RCSS if nothing changes, right? You just increment it if something changes. But, I mean, if, if you find there's a problem with that, go ahead. Because it's it's just a proposal on the table. Yeah, I think uh, this this uh, and RCSS currently takes care of uh, options which rarely changes. Uh, that is the that is the right way. I, I feel. Uh, you know, PIO is something which rarely changes. Uh, so so so. Uh, 
activation option is another thing which is which are rarely changes. So these are the things we should. Yeah, that's part of the answer. Yes, if we if we, things don't change much, having a single co single counter for them all. Okay. Now, that's, like I said, if you have one option, the way it's designed right now, if you have one option that changes a lot, mm -hmm. um, after sixteen changes, you will have to resend all the other options in full, because otherwise the sequence counters are no more comparable. Or we need to change the window in the sequence counter 16 to 32 or something like that. Oh, okay. Remember in repo, we, we want to avoid the traditional sequence counter issue whereby A would be less than B, which would be less than C, which would be less than D, which would be less than A. Uh, because of the going around the circle. And the way we avoid that is we can only say that A is less than B if they are less than 16 apart. So you see with a counter of 256, uh, A less than B, B less than C, you can never have uh, C less than A. Never have, I mean, it would take a, a large number of, of numbers uh, to, to go around the circle. So that, that's, that's the trick that we have in Ripple, to make sure that we always know that we can compare the numbers. But if two numbers are more than 16 apart, with Ripple, they cannot be compared. And that's how you realize that one of the two numbers is stuck. There is an error somewhere. And they become not comparable. So, so, um, can we go to the next slide, please, Ines? So the child can can set the bits for the options that he wants. So if he gets an RCSS which is blah, uh, and he has the AOO, which say for each of these options, here is the last RCSS at which they were changed. Uh, all those which were changed since this child synchronized, he knows he need to resynchronize them. So he will set one of the f or several of the bits to say I want this option, this option, this option. Now the child will also say at which RCSS was last synchronized. So like I said earlier, it can be duplicated for it. Because if he says I was last synchronized at this RCSS, the parent could figure, oh, then he missed this, this, this. So there's no point for a child to ask. So, so as we design, we'll figure if we need the bits or the last synchronizer CSS or both or what. But right now I've proposed both. Also, you can send more than one uh, DI, this DIO message if you can't fit all the options in one. So you have to send them uh, in a short uh, window of time. But ideally, most of the options are replaced by AOO, in which case oh, the message is not that big. For instance, if the child says I want all the options, but you, you, he sends an RCSS, which means that some of the options are actually uh, still good, then you can just send the AOO for that. So just giving an example, this child has persistent memory. It has synchronized to RCSS uh, 200. Now time passes, the child reboots. Um, and he sends this, this. And by default, he thinks, oh, I rebooted, so I don't know. So let me set all the five bits. I want to see everything. And my last RCSS was 200. The parent knows that we are at 205. So he will place in full all the options that changed between 205 and 200. And for the others for which the bit is set, he will just place the AOO saying, don't worry, this one was changed on 199, so you don't care. The yeah. last sentence uh, saying that the GIO messages 
must be sent in quick sequence or within short yeah. period of time. This is it worries me a bit. It's always page for implementation problems. Um, and that might make a difference uh, if you use one way of querying, which is the RCSS, or the other way, which is the flag. Because if, the, if a node says, I want RDP MO, and you get RDP, then it figures, well, my parents heard me, and since I requested MNO, it will probably come back soon with MNO. Whereas if you ask for, I'm uh, currently at RCSS number this, and I get RDP, then you might decide, okay, then MNO probably haven't changed. Uh, and, and the soon needs to be sooner in the latter case. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm scratching my head. So, so did, did you say, hey, I will ask M first and I will ask O later, so I'm sure that everything fits in the DIO? No, no, I'm, I'm saying if, if you ask for multiple options and there was not space enough in no. the message, in the DIO message, so it will be spread over multiple messages, as you say in the last... That's uh, how I wrote it, yeah. Right, and, uh, and so if you query by flag, then as soon as you get the first few responses, you know that the your parents heard you and are is going to provide likely all the uh, options you requested. Whereas if you query by RCSS number, you never um, know. Yeah. yeah, you get a few ones and figure okay, then probably the other ones haven't changed. Yeah, that's it's true. Short, that's that's a good reason why to have the flags. Because um, if you ask for the five, uh, as long as you don't get the five, even in the form of AOO, um, then you know you don't have it in full. Yeah. yeah, true. Very true. So it's a good reason to keep the flags. Another yeah, reason would be just to... Just highlighting the difference. Another reason would be to pull them one by one. If, for instance, if you're operating on a, uh, on a phi like 154G, you can set all the flags. Now, if you're operating on the old 15.4, and you know that you can't have a PIO and a configuration option and blah, blah, blah at the same time, then you could do two this, one for the PIO and then one for the configuration option. For instance, you, you grab the PIO, you form an address, you do your stuff, and then you ask for the configuration option and then, then you join as Ripple, as a, as a router. So you could do things in two steps. Joining as a host for which you need the PIO, joining as a router for which you need the configuration option. So, yeah, I mean, uh, for now it's it's like that. So I'm happy that it works, um, but we don't have all the details on how so intelligently the, the the device can can use that. Uh, next slide, please. I think we are close to the end. Yeah, we are at the end. So, so that's where we are, uh, mostly where I am because I did not get a lot of feedback. And so I really hoped that during this call I would get an initial feedback saying, hey, that's the sort of thing we wanted. And if it is, then we can discuss on the mailing list, you know, on how we progress on this. But at least is it what you guys expected? This sounds good to me. Okay, thank you, Dominique. Very, thank you very much, Pascal. Um, yeah, we okay. will price those systems to the mailing list. And uh, now, Raul, questions? If there is no question, Raul, move forward. We have. Yeah, I think uh, I think a review is uh, 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 we should start the okay. review of the draft. So yeah, yeah. I've, I've read the draft before, but I think a lot of things have changed uh, since then. I, I mean, I've read the draft like four months or four, four, four or five months before, uh, and it was uh, part of the interim. Anyways, coming uh, coming back to so uh, 
th th this is about root ag and uh, in the last interim uh, i was calling it rooted dao ag or storing mode ag something like that so i decided to call it root ag for the lack of better name i guess uh, well, so the primary reason why we have this is so that we have some way of end-to-end uh, -end path establishment indication to the node so that node can initiate the app traffic but uh, as it was noted in the last interim this can be made use of other purposes as well and uh, the other purpose one of the other purposes is indicating or querying the node's capabilities so this is the only message in storing mode of operation which can directly go from the root node to the target node Next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have a K flag. So this K flag essentially is the is, is set by the target node in the TIO based on which uh, the root act is generated by the root. So uh, one of the things that we discussed in the last interim is that we don't need this. We don't need the root to send. Uh, this root act for for all the DAOs. We have a flag for that, but then the problem is the intermediate six LRs don't simply forward the DAO message when they get one. So there is a time difference. There is a delay DAO timer based on which the DAO is uh, 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 generated again from the intermediate six LRs. So what this means is that the K flag has to be maintained by the intermediate six LRs. Uh, this would be very much similar to how the E flag is, is handled currently by the, all the six LRs. The only difference is at any point of time, if the six LR sees that it has received a TIO for the same target with K flag unset, it can just unset the K flag for the corresponding, uh, it, it can just unset for the K flag for the corresponding target. Uh, essentially, what it means is that it uh, the, the six LR has received a K flag as unset because the target has already received a root act one way or the other. So that should be f th th that should be good enough handling, in my opinion. Raoul, don't yeah. you think that the way you specify this there will be many uh, hack coming root act actually coming from the root because you know, I send a DAO with a flag uh, for myself. Now, for some reason, my parents sends this DAO several times. Um, and I, if, if I don't, you know, send another DAO with a K unset, there could be a good number of, of copies of my DAO somewhere above me. And even if, if now I send a DAO with a K flag unset, uh, by the time that the K flag percolates to the root, I mean, the, the root will have gotten the DAO several times. So if each time he sends a, a, a root act, I mean, there should be a sequence counter or something so that you get only one. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a so there is a sequence counter, uh, Pascal. So the path sequence. So if you see, uh, you know, what, what, what we are trying to do here. Is, okay. So the path sequence makes sure that uh, the target node knows the root act is generated for which Okay, so yeah, the root gets a DAO for a given path sequence. If there is a K, it will send it, uh, and the root act, and then until the path sequence is updated, um, there will not be another root act. So if the child doesn't get the root act, he needs to increment the path sequence, even if he doesn't, well, anyway, he has to. So he will increment the path That's sequence, true. and then he will reset the K flag. Okay, so so. Yeah, so this is one of the primary uh, design point that had to be taken care of, you know. So what happens if a root act is sent for a, uh, you know, old uh, DAO? Or it should not matter, frankly speaking, for the problem statement that we are uh, that uh, that I initially imagined uh, for the end-to-end -end traffic establishment. It does not matter, but it would it, it it is it is good to know that the root act is initiated for which DAO. So yes, it it, it handles it. Uh, next, next slide, slide. Oh. yeah thank you thank you Pascal. Uh, uh, next slide please so uh this was one of the discussion that uh, 
I, uh, one discussion I had offline with Rabi, and then we had uh, some, uh, I had some feedback from Pascal as well online. So there is a RPL unaware leaf, and it's making use of RPL network as a transit network. And in this in this case, even the rules needs to know when to initiate the application traffic. And there is an an NA ERO with EROs that are sent in unaware leaves draft. So uh, Pascal, you suggested that the NA ERO should be generated only on getting the root act back from the root. Uh, this I think this this is a completely stateless operation, so it should not be. A, I mean, from implementation point of view, this should be okay to handle. Uh, however, I'm 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 just wondering. So. If, if if I simply make change in this draft, will it be okay? Because uh, if, if uh, currently another leave draft basically sends a NS and gets a NA ERO as uh, quickly. Yeah. So uh, what happens? Uh, I mean, a rule does not have to change, but uh, is there any? I, 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 I'm just trying to think if, if is there any dependency on the another leave draft for this? Uh, uh, here I have one point. Let's say if if we send the arrow um, act based on the end-to-end um, -end DAO act, in that case maybe if there is a um, negative acknowledgement from from the root, maybe mm -hmm. we have to send a new status in the in in the arrow mm -hmm. message. In the That's NA right. when we are sending the arrow, we have to add a new status information. A new status as a year already has the status, right? So you're saying that status has to be updated based on the root act. Uh, yeah, no? Let's say root act failed because of something. It we get a negative acknowledgement from the root. Okay. In that case, we have to send a negative. Means it has a, a, a negative ARO we have to send, right? Right. When we are sending a status back to the RUL, in the ERO option, we have to send the proper status. Why this registration failed? Maybe there we need a uh, actual reason. Maybe that status field we have to add. There is a status already in here. Can't no, that, we that value, that value, whatever is defined currently okay. in the uh, in the RFC, uh, that this is not handled. This part. Well, there is a difference between the, the the messaging by which the C in this picture gets the, the prom, and what it has to tell the rule. What he has to tell the rule is one of the uh, statuses which are specified in the uh, RFC uh, that defines the NSCRO. It's not Ripple that defines that. It's 8505. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. if we are yeah. missing something in 8505, then we'll have to update it or something. But it's not because it comes from a root act versus a DCO that it makes a big difference. Right. Normally, the root act is just to tell you, hey, your route is enabled. It's mostly like if you receive it, it means, OK, even if there is nothing in it. Uh -huh. It just means, OK, the root can reach you. Um, now, if, if there is a problem, normally the root would, would send an asynchronous DCO. So, so that's, that's how I see it. The root act is more like confirming that I got it. The root act is a unicast. If, if there is a prime from the root, for instance, the state in B would be maintained. Right? The root act would not clean B. It would just clean C if you wanted to clean C. But if you really want to clean B, then the only thing the root can do is send a DCO. Right. Yeah. So, irrespective of a root act with success or failure, uh, address registration is going to be success for RUL, right? Yeah, I mean, pretty much, it's, it's just something to hold. Um, so basically, uh, C is ready to send the NA ERO, but it has set the K flag. So now it needs to hold sending the NA ERO till it gets the root act. When it gets the root act, it just you know, unlocks sending the NA ERO. But the root act just, just confirms that the connectivity has been established. It's not supposed to mean anything uh, for now, because as a separate discussion, we can talk about capabilities. But uh, for now, it's as, as specified, it would just mean, OK, um, the DAO has percolated all the way to the root, and that's it. So the root can reach you. Yeah, that's right. 
that's right. So, so it's just unholding DNA, but DNA could have been prepared already. The idea is not to give a bad status at that time. Because B would not know. That's right. So if, if actually the root has to be cleared up for some reason, then DC has to be made unique for, for clearing up the root. Yeah, in, so, in, part of it, yeah. So one more thing that uh, uh, one more thing that has to be clarified as part of the slide is that currently in the draft, the root act carries only the transit information option, but now with external targets, the root act needs to send back the target option to the target. Uh, to the to the six LR that uh, external target. The reason being, other you to know for which external target was this uh, root act been generated. Yeah. So yeah, that is the, the, I think this should not be a big problem. Uh, but yeah, that that is something that has to be explicitly added in the draft. Next slide, please. Okay, and then uh, we have this uh, capability query. I, I, I mean, I just wanted to depict a picture saying that now there is a way in which root has to root can say, send an asynchronous root act. Now, this is where you know this nomenclature of root act does not make sense uh, because in this case it's no more an act, but it's a capability query. So uh, this is where I wanted to see if we can come up with some other name. But basically, here we are, asynchronous root act, and then we send it out with the capabilities. Uh, uh, so this 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 point can be handled like this. Uh, the capability queries can be handled like this. But here, like uh, this capability uh, capability C would have shared with B already, right? Yeah. This, this capability is also for the like use in a DAO projection kind of thing, right? Yeah, so so let's say for example, root wants to know what C has, or what C supports, right? So uh, if 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 root wants to know, if let's say for example, root wants to install a route, PDAO, projected DAO, hmm. then root needs to get some information from C. So this is one way to get that information. This is the way to get that information because this is the message that can be directly sent to root, uh, sent to the target. Sorry. Yeah, how last time we discussed I how I thought that this exchange would be a new message. So, so it's because, it's a new message, uh, but I'm I'm not sure if the name is uh, correct. So if you're talking, so it's it's a new message, right? I mean, uh, oh, you're saying like it's not a new message, but then the DAO is not. And and for me, the new message would be uh, root sending a query, and. <clears throat> the, the C sending back the response to query. So like capability query and, and response. Yeah, I think okay. this tool can keep separate, Rahul. This uh, DAO okay. and root arc and the capability query can be separate. Well, the thing is the root arc is only needed if there is nothing else. Like okay. if, if, for instance, you're in a situation where each time there is a DAO, for which the root doesn't have the capability, you're sure that the root will come and query the, the capability, or if there is anything else, then, for instance, if, if C is a 6LR, and it does um, a Dardac exchange for a RUL node, then it will get the, the, the DAC back, meaning that it's reachable. So, so if you remember the way neighbor discovery is written, there is something that says that NAD is, is only needed if you don't have any upper layer uh, information telling you that the connectivity is still going on. And same thing, this, this root tag would be only needed if uh, there is no other message that's going around that shows you that you've got connected. So if, if Essentially, you're doing this query, then you don't even set the cab yet because because you know, the query is coming and that means you're reachable. That's right. Yeah. So 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 so. But 
we want a separate message for this then uh, so yeah i think so okay okay so we can completely uh, decouple this uh, these two points then yeah so this can be part of the capability draft rather yeah. it put up somewhere here right and this draft would say hey um if if this or anything else is going on that makes sure that c is reachable then c doesn't need to set the key bit I think this is better. Okay. Uh, I, In I, two scenario, this uh, root arc is required. One, we, when the node joins the network first time, or did it did some parent switch? Uh, in those scenario, maybe the root arc will be used. That's what I think. For the parent switch, uh, what is the reason, Ravi? I mean, uh, I, I, I know in our previous implementation we used that, but uh, I still think maybe for the parent switch, maybe. But that uh, because I have switched the path, then I have to know that uh, in that path uh, it is reachable, right? That's okay, you will answer. See, I am now connected to B because of something I moved switch to C, I switched to A. Switched to A, 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 but via A, I might not be reachable because of some yeah, issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, this is what we did, did in our implementation anyways, right? Yeah, so, correct, correct. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's that's all. I, I think I think this is the last slide. Uh, uh, all right. Thank you very much, Raul. Um, question, further questions? Mm, Raul, you mentioned that when uh, Pascal joined, you would like to back some to some slides, if I understood correctly. No, so 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 what, so what I what I said was, uh, if Pascal is not back, then I, I I can present some of the points with regards to uh, eliding RPL info. But he has already done that, so, so, so that's okay. nothing for me to say. Ah, okay. So, um, okay, we will collect the action points for this meeting, and we will send by with the mailing list with the link to the recording. Um, so, do you would like question? You would like to meet in June? That would be nice. Yeah, I'm open to meeting in June. Okay, to continue working. Um, and Ines, I guess as chairs, uh, we, we have to, for our own working groups, we have to request a meeting uh, for virtual yeah. 108, right? Yes, there was a discussion uh, at the beginning. Uh, what the working group uh, would like to do, like meet during IETF 108 or later? because we are going to have uh, two slots. I mean, we discussed that with one slot will be enough if we meet during ITF 108 or have an interim of two hours later. If we do interim... The, no, it's in the either pad. There were split opinions on whether having a meeting during that week or having a separate interim meeting. What's your opinion? Do you like? Would you like to have a meeting within the ITF week, Pascal, or rather not? Uh, not necessarily. I really love the way we did it last time, so we spread over one month, so we could find the best time for for each group. I mean, the the, the, the reason why everything is packed is because we travel. Otherwise, uh, you know, doing what you just did uh, for finding this particular slot is really perfect because we can really find where we get most attendance. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't mind it's that week or another week. Okay, and two hours is fine, right? Two hours, I think, no. Yes, yes my vote is just do what you did for 107. It was really great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, we will, anyway, uh, request, uh, complete with the mailing list. Uh, I'll collect all the um, information. 
Okay, uh, there is no further questions. No, please, please come back to me on, on the lighting yeah. thing because I still didn't get a good sense that the group wants it or not. And uh, well, I invested time on it, so so uh, I would love to see if if uh, we want it or not. Okay. Um, okay, I will stop recording if there is no further questions now. Thank you.